Um, I've been around all my life in, in many countries, many different uh, companies, uh, not so much actually, three, three large ones. Um, and uh, I've noticed something that our industry is basically and mainly driven by transactional procurement. So uh, our customers' prospects are basically only selecting us on, based on, on cost for the majority, I would say from 99%. If someone wants to, uh, to basically challenge this number, uh, just raise your hand. Uh, but basically, uh, our industry moved into a commodity trading. We buy basically logistic services, uh, air freight, sea freight, uh, ground services, the same way as we buy, I would say, a pound of, uh, of tomatoes or apples, uh, and I'm not referring uh, to apples in Cupertino. But uh, no, that's, that's basically something which has worried me. And I wanted to address that today. So we had already two presentations, uh, three presentations before mine. So uh, we touch a lot on innovation. We touch a lot on relationship. We touch a lot on passion. But I think we missed one thing. And I'm going to be very arrogant for the presenters from before. Uh, we very rarely touch on the customers of our customers being 3PLs. So it's very rare when you receive a tender, when you receive a bid, that you are asked to basically present a solution to enhance the customer's experience. But we are talking about enhancing the customer experience of our customers, but not necessarily the customers of our customers' experience. So I think that's something which needs to be reset. And on top of that, it's very challenging because, as we discussed previously, innovation is, um, is very important, that's for sure. But we are still in an extremely low margin business. So innovation always comes with a cost. You need to invest to hopefully get the returns. Um, new ideas are there, you know, uh, new techs, uh, uh, Uber for freight, and we, we are reading about that every day, uh, but the reality is, is, is basically different, okay? Um, having said that, uh, I've just prepared a few slides. Uh, I'm gonna be very quick on, uh, on the commercial one uh, and not gonna bother you, but I think I have to do that because I'm still paid by this company. Uh, uh, basically, Siva, uh, a legacy company, uh, it's basically a patchwork of several companies, fairly new company, less than 10 years old a presence uh, on five continents, 160 uh, countries, 40,000 plus employees, 1,000 locations, uh, flirting with 7 billion revenue in 2016, and uh, 86 million square feet uh, of warehouse space available worldwide. Services, uh, which might be important for the one in the room, not knowing about SIVA, contract logistic, air freight, ocean freight, ground and supply chain solutions. So we are, a three, four PL, if you wish, uh, a very traditional LSP. So <clears throat> the discussion today is, is about uh, what helps us to make the difference between, like I said, being a provider and, and developing a partnership. So I need to go back a little bit with the history of SIVA. Like I said, it's a patchwork of uh, several companies, EGL, Circle, uh, Crane, uh, CTI, TNT Logistics, and all those are names which, like three years ago, were totally unknown to me because I didn't know SIVA. So it just gives you a feeling that uh, what, what we went through. But nevertheless, we still have customers, and some are in this room today, we've been dealing with for over 20 years. So being in such a commodity uh, market, uh, why are they sticking around? Okay, and I think that's because uh, we've been, up to a certain extent, with some of our customers, we've not been very successful with all of them. I wish we would have, otherwise we would be in, in a much bigger, uh, I would say, uh, size and, and, and footprint worldwide. But we've been able to share values and share cultural beliefs uh, to basically go to the next steps with our customers. So, <clears throat> What does it mean concretely? Um, it's a transactional market. 
of course, what drives decision with our customers is first the price. Okay, if anybody sees that differently, again, raise your hand. But it's very rarely uh, you get uh, selected uh, for a solution, for a service, for a concept, which costs 50% more than your competitor. I mean, it happened to me once, but I think it was a real investment that the customer wanted to make, and he wanted to make this, this uh, investment uh, for, for its customer. So basically, once again, uh, we are in a transactional environment. Um, it's a throat-cutting uh, exercise um, in the air and ocean uh, business. Uh, the, it's, it's very often procured yearly, uh, and you have years where it's a carrier market, and you have years where it's a shipper market. Okay, uh, the one uh, who have to deal with this uh, situation currently, they see the trend changing in the air cargo industry. So today, uh, it's going to be a very challenging, I would say, three to four months that we are going to see in the air cargo industry, because uh, we are going to basically miss capacity out of China. So the price will double, most probably. We can predict that, except if some carriers decide to basically bring capacity on the market, okay? Are they, the first one going to do it is gonna try to, uh, uh, airline trying to do that is going to try to basically uh, take the money which is on the market because uh, the freight rates are they used to be like two months ago around $3 a kilo out of uh, China into the US. And we are today talking at market rate which are over $5 a kilo. And we are gonna go over six, I can already tell you. So it's a very challenging market. So how do we basically protect our customers and the customer of our customers against this type of situation? Uh, good question. If the customer is basically floating a tender every year, how do you want to do that? You secure capacity, you are an LSP, a 3PL, you basically secure 400 tons from Shanghai to the US, and uh, at $3 a kilo, and then the customer comes and said, I want to give you 800 tons, and you said, I'm covered only for 400 tons for $3 a kilo, but the market now for those 400 tons and above is $6 a kilo. Do we overcome such a situation with bidding the business and putting the, the business up for tender every year? Actually, some have tried. You can do that. You can even reduce your cost when it's basically a cheaper market. But when the market is changing like it is the case today, you don't do it. So what does it mean? We are seeing a trend in our industry with some of our customers, mainly tech and automotive, where basically this entire freight forwarding, commodity trading, I would say, is moving into a cost plus model. So we buy capacity and we basically put it up on the market and uh, we make it available to the customers and to the customer of our customers. You can imagine, you know, Apple, I don't want to name them, but they are coming with big plans for the 10th anniversary of the iPhone. So something big is going to come. Uh, the entire market in China is talking about it. Uh, that's going to be massive volume, which, is going, which are going to fly from uh, China all over the world. And there is already a lack of capacity now. So the market will explode. So how do we protect customers like Apple, like the others, and make sure that they get the capacity because it's gonna be a disaster for them to launch a product and not having it on the shelf. And that's the big, the big challenge that we have today. And it applies basically to ocean freight, to ground freight, but also to very traditional warehousing business. In the freight industry, in the logistic industry, we are, like the German says, we are all cooking with the same water. We are really all cooking with the same water. We use the same trucking companies, we use the same airlines, we use the same carriers, we use the same warehouse providers. What makes the difference? The price, but 
since we are all cooking with the same water, the price of the water is the same. Okay? I think we forget in this industry uh, over the years, uh, being LSPs, what the S stands for, for service. I think we have, to a great extent, have not really focus on what counts for the customer or for customers, the service. And that's something which needs to change. And that's something that now plays a major role. And we see a shift with some of the big shippers in the world where they don't go into negotiating prices. They negotiate service. And they let us deal on a cost plus model uh, with the capacity. Because that's becoming a challenge. We all want our goods faster, quicker, and cheaper delivered home. That's what we want. So partnership is crucial. Uh, the innovation. I thought a lot before putting this slide here. Uh, but it's needed. The world is moving faster. Um, the way we are making deals are moving faster. Um, you have some very, very innovative people on the market. Elon Musk, you know, every tweet is a new ID. Uh, and uh, it challenges, basically, all his vendors. And that's a big time challenge. Okay? When he wants to basically launch uh, the Model 3, uh, which is uh, basically supposed, the largest to, supposed to be the largest commercial launch of a product of the history, you have to think a little bit differently. You need to bring innovation. You need to turn the stock way faster. You need to deliver the cargo in sequence way faster. And you have to do it with an extremely challenging production plan with Tesla. Those things are very, very challenging for us, and they require innovation. We have not moved into the, mo the mode, to my opinion, in the logistic world, where we are anticipating innovations. I mean, we can talk about the drones, deliveries, and all these things. But you're not going to move big volumes. I think the 3D printings will make a difference. That's for sure. It will require a lot of capex. But it's going to take another 15 to 20 years. We have seen already GE uh, making aircraft engines out of uh, 3D printers. Small aircraft engines. It's all available on YouTube. You can see that. So it's happening. Innovation is important. But today, the innovation is not so much on the LSP side. It's more on the shipper side. And it's going to bypass the logistic supply chain. And it's going to have an impact. We just need to, give, to get ready. So to my point, I think we've been extremely reactive in the years. And uh, I'm going to use a very brutal word and, and being very arrogant. I think in the logistic industry, we've been retarded. Because we've been always reactive. We reacted to the market conditions. We reacted to the capacity. We reacted to the new technologies. Only a few of us have been on the forefront. And that's what needs to change. So it needs to change with a better education around logistics. Some countries, some parts of the world, they are completely lacking it. I mean, I've, I've been now 18 months in the US. I've, I'm still looking for a freight forwarding school. If you know what, one, I'd like to know about it. Because I'm looking for freight forwarders. Rather than having to train them, I would like to have them trained. In Germany, widely available. Widely available. In China, you can find them easily. In the US, it's not there. So that's the things we need to look at. And, and that's what will help us to move from being reactive to be proactive in the world of logistics. I'm, I'm very, I would say, brutal and arrogant with my comments, but I think this is where we stand. We should not paint a picture which is nicer than what the reality is. So this is something where we've been in the logistic industry doing a fantastic job, reinventing ourselves, cutting our costs, re-optimizing, but it's not innovation, OK? We've been basically focusing on the cost, providing in-house consulting to ourselves, to our customers, 
with the ability to implement and execute new ideas. Okay? And planning, doing, checking, and acting as something where the logistic industry is very strong and very good at. So I'm praising our industry here, and uh, that's something we should never lose. So we've seen a lot of uh, restructuring plans with a lot, of, with, with a lot of logistic companies happening with, with my, with SIVA, we've seen with others cutting cost. I think very often we make the mistake of cutting cost in this field. Continuous improvement should always be protected in our industry because that's the little piece of new ideas and creativity that we still have in house, and we should always maintain it. So that's something which needs to be protected, and I think that's something that shippers and customers are demanding from us. So physical versus in intellectual capacity, uh, we are moving boxes. We are moving boxes in a warehouse, we are moving boxes on, a, on an aircraft, we are moving boxes on a vessel, we are moving boxes on a truck. Okay, how do we add value? We talked about that. We are missing brains, and that's something we need to focus on. That's really something which is in high demand, and that we are not basically focusing on, and we are not stepping back and asking ourselves, do we have enough intellectual calories in our processes or in the solution we put together to the customers to say, yes, we are ready to basically build a strong partnership with customers. And here again, a lot of our customers, when they float a tender once a year, every three years, it's not even in, in the bid. So you make your proposal, you bring in new ideas, but when you quote for ocean freight and you have to quote for 1,700 lines, uh, from all over the world to all over the world, there is no room for innovation. There is no room for ideas. There is no room for new ideas. Because if you are changing the format, they cannot measure you anymore. So you are completely disqualified. That's a risk. So part of the problem is with the LSPs, but also part of the problems are with shippers who are basically not accepting to think outside the box because they look at the cost first. And that's the nature of the business. So I would say this is most probably something that if, if you have to take something out from this presentation is, and I'm just repeating what I said in the introduction, this is basically where do we position the customer of our customers in the entire equation? It's very rarely there. Maybe the the industry which does that very well is the pharma industry. They are very good, very, very good at talking about their patient. They talk about their supply chain, but everything they do is for their patient. Very traditional, industrial, FMCG, high tech, automotive. The customer of their customers, the customers, the user experience, is very rarely mentioned. We see that naturally emerging with Amazon and, and, and all the, uh, the new cores and, and uh, e-commerce, of course, it's very important, but it's only for the last piece of the business. It's not so much for the massive flows coming from uh, the Far East into uh, the US, the Far East into, the, into uh, Europe or whatever. It's, it's not so much there. They are still managing transaction and, and buying on a very transactional basis. So we see, of course, a, a trend in pattern, um, and, and it's, it's coming uh, very big, and that's something uh, where I think 3PL should uh, invest a lot of money. And it's actually, I say a lot of money, but I would say a lot of time, because the majority of the 3PL they have more data about the supply chain of their customers than the customers themselves. And the customers, they don't even know about that. So there is a great deal of identifying the waste which can be done through this exercise. 
Uh, we've been doing it with, with some tech and automotive companies, and it has changed the entire way of leading the relationship. The relationship have moved really into a partnership, into prediction, into us driving the validation of the forecast. You have to imagine a tech company coming to us and said, here are our forecast, what do you think about it? It's happening, it's happening here in the US. So I think there is there uh, a lot to be uh, looked at, to be invested. We need to be more data driven as LSPs and uh, we need to look a little bit uh, in the back and, and into our, our system, into our ERPs, into our TMS and into our WMS, the data is all there. Good, and uh, waste. We still have to deal with a lot of waste. Uh, I said we are, that's something the continuous improvement aspect should, should cover in, in, in a way of, of managing a relationship with a customer. But that's really something which is massive. This is really, really, really uh, uh, something which needs to look at. And that's something which can look at from the 3PL side, from the LSP side, and also from the shipper side. So not all the items are uh, applying uh, to all business case, but the defect, the overprocessing, uh, the inventory, the transportation, the motion are things which needs to be looked at. And they are helping to basically move out from the transactional uh, relationship with the customers to a more partnership and, and collaborative approach. So with that said, I've not been into uh, as much detail as at the three previous uh, presentations, but um, I just wanted to give you a flavor of where our industry should go. And uh, Shipper as well as LSP needs to understand that transactional procurement is not necessarily the answer to an efficient supply chain. 